Um, but I'd like to know, for, for you guys, what, what topic I haven't covered or we haven't covered, and I want to give you guys at least a, a, a quick, uh, just couple minute over, overview. So I'm just going to talk about a couple things real quick here, and I want you guys to be thinking, wh what are the things we've not covered in our class that you have still questions about or you're wondering about, and I'll give you guys a quick, a quick overview about um, those topics. Okay, so I just want to end with saying, um, um, you know, well, I want to be Pollyannish about this. Our, the, the biodiversity on our planet is under threat as we started the semester out talking about, right? That, that's, that's real. That's totally real. It's a scary, scary thing. Um, you should be scared. It's important to be scared. But you shouldn't be scared into frozenness, right? We spent the last several weeks talking about examples that we, we know how to make things better. Is it perfect? No, but we can certainly make more birds. We can certainly make more vertebrates. We can certainly make more conserved uh, areas that aren't trashed, right? Um, but this is the reality. So this is the, this is the potential um, transformation of some different components of our planet. So the surface of the earth, um, the likelihood of how much these things will be changed in the next couple decades, um, oceans, kelp forests, seagrass meadows, right? There's, there's a lot. So 50% means uh, there's a high probability that we'll lose half of what we have had in the past, right? And so you'll see a lot of these things are really close to that 50% or exceeding that. So the transformation of the Earth's surface, we're already there, right? We've gone more than uh, uh, half. Wetlands, we have 91% of our wetlands that used to exist in California are gone, right? So we only have 9% left. Those 9% that remain are not, you know, charging and super healthy. So these are real issues. But Conservation biology is one of several different things that have exploded, and hopefully you've, you've taken away that conservation biology is grounded in biology, grounded in life sciences, but as you've seen from our readings and our activities, it involves all kinds of stuff. It involves human behavior, it involves, involves sociology, a little bit of economics, all this kind of stuff, right? So we're not driven 100% by those other things, but it's biology in context, right, to have effective solutions, effective responses. And so examples of some of these newer disciplines or sub-disciplines that have grown up in the last couple years are things like invasion. This paper is, this is, this diagram is from a paper on invasive species, which is why they have this one at the center. But, but restoration ecology, global change, um, uh, uh, managed relocations, all that kind of stuff. They're all really interesting, need a lot of people to go into them, need a lot of great new young energy, and they're potentially great careers for, for folks. Um, there's all these things that we've talked about, uh, fragmentation and climate change and invasive species and all this kind of stuff, right? But we have, we do know how to respond to these things. We do know what to do. It's a matter of will. So it's not as if, I and mean, we still need to invent a lot of stuff as we talked about, for example, with the condors, and we had to figure out how to do the double clutching and all that kind of stuff. So there's still a lot to be figured out, but it's totally within our grasp, right? It's totally within our powers to figure this out and to move forward. And we can't avoid all these problems. We're going to have massive more problems, to be sure, guaranteed. But we can avoid going off the cliff, right? We can avoid falling off and just everything becoming a Blade Runner hellscape kind of thing, right? Um, and, and all of these things are fantastic tools that, that we can deploy. Things like restoration, things like um, uh, uh, protected air, establishment of protected areas, and so on and so forth. We also have uh, uh, learned that there's all kinds of neat, so not only do we have those, those disciplines of taking action right now, but also conservation biology has grown to suck in all these other cool things, right? So maybe like a discipline that no one would have associated with modern science, something like, like uh, archaeology or paleo, you know, the study of old dinosaurs and stuff of that nature, right? Some of that stuff has direct relevancy to us because some things like when the asteroid hit in the Yucatan and had massive impacts, that was a huge change, right? Over a very short amount of time. When a, when a historic volcano erupted in Java, had a lot of impacts in a you know, very short amount of time. So we can learn from those things. So we can pull in these, these what might seem to be disparate sources of knowledge in different disciplines um, and I'd say conservation biology has become massively welcoming. I would say it, it always had that predisposition, but especially in the last 20 years, it's become much more inclusive. 
it's become much more interested in being intentionally inclusive to whatever the metric you want to pick is. Uh, different, uh, you know, individual demographics of people, but also intellectual approaches, where they live in the world, the global south, all this kind of stuff. And that only makes conservation biology stronger and more effective and more helpful. When we talk about these issues, when we talk about conservation stuff, sometimes, and, and, and maybe you guys, well, so let me ask you guys. So overall, would you say most of our example, when you would do one of our classes or a week, some, a week or two is worth of activity, would you say you're overall stoked or you're overall depressed about stuff? And be honest, would you guys say most of the stuff was made, made you depressed that we learned about this semester or were you kind of neutral or were you positive? Would, so who said they were depressed or, or, or you'd feel negative about it? Okay, so raise your hand high. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about eight people. Okay, who said they were neutral? Neutral and stuff. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so about the same. And how people would like, oh, I mean, I feel empowered, I feel positive or whatever. Okay, one, two, okay, two, okay. So, so mostly kind of bummed out or kind of middle of the road, only a few of you felt empowered, right? Which is often what I hear, right? And, and, and I totally get it, right? I totally understand. Um, but I think it's important to say that conservation biology is an applied science, as you've hopefully learned, right? I mean, we use theory and we use ideas, but really it's an applied science. It would be like a, comparing biology to cancer doctor, right? Or ER room doctor or something like that, right? We exist because we see problems, right? We exist because we see cancer and we're trying to, so, so by definition, that discipline deals with a lot of negative stuff, right? It's just, you're dealing with people that have unfortunate diagnoses and, and you know, very hard emotionally and it's tough. Um, we are the same thing, right? This discipline is the same thing. It's looking at, we used to have a lot of buffalo, now we have very few buffalo. It's looking at, we used to have a lot of, tons of wetlands, now we have a handful of wetlands and they're kind of skanky, right? And that, get, that, can be, that can be hard. That can be hard, right? Day in, day out, year in, year out. And so just like some of the other things, and I know not everybody here is gonna go into conservation biology for a career, but just like, but, but you will, many of you go into challenging other subjects, right? you need to find the way, uh, something to maintain your, your mojo. You know what I'm saying? You need to find a way. And some, some of us do it with gallows humor. I am, have, tell very bad jokes and things, and I swear a lot as you guys have figured that out, right? That's sort of how I deal with this stuff, right? Um, but we have to figure out a way that's healthy that, that, that you keep your passion for dealing with cancer, dealing with the endangered species, dealing with the whatever it is, um, and not get turned off because we, you cannot be turned off. I, I need you all to not be turned off. I need you all to be engaged and stay engaged with these topics. Dealing with racism, dealing with horrible views of othering and all that stuff in our society, right? It's very, very easy to throw in the towel and say, F it, right? This thing is not worth it, whatever. Um, I disagree. I disagree. I think it is worth staying engaged. The trick is just to make sure that you don't become as toxic and as, and as dark as some of the topics we're dealing with. And so maybe you like to do karaoke at, on Thursday nights. Maybe you, I don't, I don't know what your deal is. Maybe you like to sing in the car. Maybe you like to uh, read really bad novels or whatever, right? Make sure that you all as you're getting ready to move on to your next career stage, you, you find that thing and you need to blow on that candle and you need to make sure that candle is protected and that you always have that resource to, to go to when you're just bummed, right? When you're just like, I can't think anymore. I just, and you know, yes, it's helpful to have maybe a libation or two here or there, but better to do it without, <laughs> without medication and things like that, right? It's better to, to have physical activity. It's better to have something you do, or even better yet, you do with, in community with other folks. That you go surfing, or you go to, I don't know, dance recitals or something, I don't, whatever. Um, but it's really, really important that you all identify what your jam is, 
and you make that a priority. Just like you're making a priority, I gotta get a job that makes this much money and I wanna get this kind of thing. Also make a priority, what is the thing that's gonna keep your flame going, right? Because in disciplines like conservation biology, it is very easy that if you're not actively making sure you're conserving that flame, it can go out. And once that flame goes out and you're dealing with these challenging things that we're all dealing with in our world, it, it becomes incredibly difficult, if not impossible to get through. So, um, so yeah. So having said that, let's take a quick look at what, and so we did our, so here's what you guys all pulled together. So these were our stories that we all looked at over the last, this semester, right? So these were our scoop it stories. So we went through and we, you guys all scored them. And here we go. So here's the stuff we we're just talking about. So this is, of all the stories that you guys picked, I mean, one or two I put in, but they're, but they're almost all your stories. Um, you guys said, so of the, is it negative? Or was that, was that posting a negative, neutral, or, or you know, was it about problems and negative? Was it about, uh, or excuse me, negative and problems, positive and solutions or neutral? And about 45% of them were negative, were about bad things happening, challenges without a solution. Right, and about forty, but about forty percent were positive, right? Were positive, and and not that many were sort of just down the middle of the road, right? Not that many were were uh, just uh, uh, half and half or or something else. So um, so yes, it's true that it's true that that my lectures or or people like me, our lectures may be you know depressing or the readings are depressing, right? But that's sort of par for the course, right? I'm not trying to make an excuse for myself, whatever, but, but right? So, so by definition, this issue is, is challenging, right? And so, so it's important that when we engage in these issues, we don't run away from that negativity, right? We need to start with where the problem is, right? When Hitler is invading Europe, you don't start with, well, you know, it's pretty flowers today, right? You're like, oh my God, Hitler's invading Europe. Like, let's talk about this, right? And then we can get to the other stuff. So again, as, a, as an applied discipline, we start with the challenge. We always start with the challenge. Otherwise, why would, we, why would we bother, right? If we had a million birds and we had a million different bears and stuff, like, what? let's go out and hang out with the bears. We don't need to study them and try to make more of them kind of thing. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, um, all right. So having said that, what are the topics or, or what are things that we didn't cover that you guys were hoping we would go into some depth on that we just either didn't cover or just skimmed it very close? this semester. Nothing. I covered everything. Lillian. Um, I think this is something that I was like kind of wanting me personally yeah, yeah. to go into is like even looking at current bills that Oh laws. Are, yeah, laws that are for conservation bio and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. No. So I would say I would say the 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 most probably the currently most important um, legal framework related to conservation biology and all this and that is the thirty by thirty plan. So I didn't lecture very much on that. I had to, I had some readings for you guys. So the thirty by thirty um, is uh, just so that we're on the same page here. Um, this is the website I directed you guys to when, when we had that, that ruling, but the short version is this, is, this is an example of percent protection targets, right? Which is like, hey, we wanna save a certain amount. This really got going with some, um, uh, about four, geez, how old am I? This really got going about 35 years or so ago off of Florida. And, uh, and so um, a Kennedy Space Center, where we shoot rockets to the moon and that kind of stuff. And essentially, um, because we shot rockets to the moon and the rockets might blow up, as you maybe saw with, we had some posts about, about, about Elon Musk's um, you know, space spaceship, space. SpaceX blew up some of the wetland. And like, not blew up, but like effing blew up. Like, like chunks the size of this room of concrete were falling down, right? I mean, like really, really crazy stuff um, from that massive first 
test flight of that rocket um, that, that took off in South Texas. Um, and it's not a coincidence that they picked Texas because Texas is like, okay, cool, right? Um, uh, anyway, uh, so, so in the Kennedy Space Center, Florida, back in the day, um, they were like, hey, no people can come around. One, they were worried about weird Cold War terrorism or something like that, right? But then also they were just worried that the rocket, like what happened with, what happened with, Mr. Muck, with Mr. Musk's uh, SpaceX, that something might go wrong and it would fall and kill somebody. So like, no, it had an exclude, they had to have an exclusion zone around the rocket launch site in, around Cape Canaveral. Well, so this, this fish biologist was there and was, was monitoring stuff and he started noticing, oh my God, the fish are way bigger. In, in Florida, there's a lot of fishermen, there's a lot of people, a lot of fishermen. And it's like, oh my God, this place has tons of fish. So we started working on that stuff and he started realizing, oh my gosh, these, what we now call marine protected areas really do work. And so, and so um, started working on um, some targets and realized that just saying some, you know, what's the right amount? Should we protect 77% of the earth? Should we protect 42% of the, like, what's the right number? Like, I don't know. And he realized as a manager, not a scientist, but as a manager, he realized we can't just say protect this. We need to have a quick, we need to have a, a, a funky slogan, right? So uh, he, he started like this. Uh, the, the first one was like, like, I can't remember the first one. The first one was something like, 20 by 20 or whatever. And so, so it was, it was an, an easy target to remember that he could go explain to politicians and people and they got it. And so, so things have happened since then, but we've inherited this in this form of this current policy, which um, this is stemming from Governor Gavin Newsom's exe uh, governor's executive order, which says we will protect 30% of California or 30% of California's land and sea will be in a form of a protected area by 2030. This is paralleling stuff. He didn't invent this out of whole cloth. This is paralleling stuff that's come from the, from, uh, the IUCN and international. And we also have a, a, a movement at the federal level, but it's most sophisticated here in California where we have lots of stuff. So this website, so to answer Lillian's question. So this website that I direct you guys to, or you can just Google 30 by 30 California. So I've been going to, I've been attending panels and giving feedback to these guys for two years now, two, two and a half years, something like that. So this is really happening. This is, this is not like a theoretical mission. There's a lot of resources that have been marshaled to get this to happen. Um, and so you can scroll through this. We have, uh, we have a data portal here. You can look at that. And so this isn't a law like Lillian was asking, but it is state policy. And all of our state agencies are marching to this, to this tune. So it's really driving stuff. Where we are is essentially we've gone through the process and we've gone through the plan and essentially we, we basically have the plan now as to, as to how we're going to go about doing it. So the next couple years, the next six years or seven years or so is all about enacting the plan, right? Um, and so that's, that's 30 by 30. So that, that's an example of uh, probably the most important conservation policy going on right now, at least in California. Other things, other questions. What are some things you guys would like to hear more about or, or that I didn't touch on very much that you'd like to learn more about? Well, I know you talked a lot about techniques and stuff that were developed during the process mm -hmm. of uh, conservation biology, but mm -hmm. I was also very curious of like more modern day uh, tools. Know, tools. You know, right. So, so the the um, one of the best one is Wild Labs, right? I, I you guys had that reading. Uh, so this is a great resource if you guys want to learn more about uh, like sort of cutting edge technology related stuff uh, in relation to conservation biology. So again, I, I point you guys to here and, and you had a reading from here. But this is you guys can all join this. I would encourage you guys to join this. This is a free. It's a, it's a group. They have meetups. They have virtual meetups for, with people from around the world. They have like physically in-person meetups as well. And these are all folks um, mostly that come from other backgrounds that, that I shouldn't say that's not necessarily true. It's people from all different backgrounds. But some people are like hardcore nerdy professor types like me. Others are hobbyists. Others are grassroots folks in you know, sub-Saharan Africa. But they all share this goal of, of achieving some conservation target. So they're like, I got this drone. I want to monitor poaching. I don't know what to do. 
And so there's a million different groups in here. So there's a million different, there's a million different groups in here. There's acoustic monitoring, AI for conservation, autonomous camera traps for insects, uh, uh, citizen science, um, all these different things. So you click on conservation dogs. I don't even know what that one is. I'm not so good. So okay, there's about people using dogs to support conservation, probably, I would guess, sniffing out invasive species, things of that nature. Um, and so you can learn about this and you can join these discussion groups and you can know nothing. So I'd start with going and reading through stuff and then you can just sort of jump in. And it's a very, very, very supportive community. So you're like, hey, I'm just getting into this. I'm not sure what to do. Um, I got this camera, tra I got these five camera traps. I'm worried there's this endangered, I don't know, predator going through my property. I'm trying to figure out if it's here or not. How can I help, how can I better manage this? And somebody will chime in, hey, here's some code to do this. Here's, here's a direct, here's instructions on how to do it. So it's basically a, a community focused on cutting edge, cutting edge conservation technology. And a lot of times people will collaborate on here. So there'll be somebody from Finland with somebody from Australia and somebody from Guam and whatever, and they're like working together virtually. Um, so it's pretty cool. So that's Wild Labs. That's one example of the stuff. I would say, I would say um, uh, for you guys, I would say all of you, just about, should have, um, so you, you all need to have strong writing skills. You all need to have strong data visualization skills, no matter what career you're going into. Uh, you also pretty much now, if it's anything even vaguely related to anything we're talking about, you need strong GIS skills. So, so GIS has become, for many of us, just like being able to use Word and Excel and that kind of stuff. So if you've not taken um, GIS, you really need to. So our, our majors obviously have to, but bio majors, um, you should. <laughs> So we have 328, which is our more rigorous version. We also have 228, which is more a general introduction for, for, for all, the, all the disciplines across campus. Um, and so those are both offered in the fall. So I would consider, I would definitely think you guys should take that. Um, and, and, and being able to manipulate data in space and all that kind of stuff is really, really important. Um, and then I would say the next probably most common one would be something related to um, computer programming. Like, like, like command line programming, that's really, really helpful and that, that's, that's becoming ubiquitous. We use R, the, the programming language R, but, but, but there's various things, Python and other things. But um, you don't, again, with all these things, you don't have to be the world's best GIS person, but you need a basic functional understanding. You need, you need to be able to do the, the basic, sim most simplest things. Um, and so, and then I'd say the third one would probably, most generic one, there's, there's things like eDNA and stuff, but that's, that's more specific, but I would say, the third most generic technology that would be really good for you guys to think about getting exposed to are, are the use of uh, drones. And so those are, that, that's massively exploded. And so we have a, a course in the fall that's an introduction to how do you safely use them and how do you fly them and how do you collect data with them, et cetera. And that's, uh, that's our drones class. It's called Introduction to Remotely Piloted Systems. So I'd say definitely you guys should have some kind of GIS experience. You should have some, uh, and, and then if you're so inclined, I would, and I think you should have some amount of command line experience, and I think um, drones would be a, also a very marketable skill. Every, all of our students that are really good with drones, um, I think the, the cheapest someone has started off is at like a $70,000, $80,000 a year, and several of them are like start up close to six figures um, because not many people know how to use these technologies well, and we use them in a lot of diverse situations. Supporting conservation, those students aren't all doing conservation now, but many of them are. But um, you get commercially certified, right? If you decide to. Yeah. So so um, uh, it, how we do it in our classes, there's a commercial drone operator's license called Part 107, FAA Part 107 license. Um, technically speaking, we're we're trying to be able to teach it ourselves, but but legally right now, it's only you can only take the test at an airport, and so you have to pay. So we can't control it. So so we strongly encourage you all. We want everybody to take the test, but we, we can't give you the test. But what we do is you go take the test. If you take the test, you get an A on the, on the final or the midterm, depending on who's teaching it that year. So it's like, it's like a strong incentive. And all you have to do is pass it. You don't, you know, it's not what grade you get on that test. It's just you pass it. And if you take our class, it's a very easy to pass test. Um, that is sort of your ticket to working with any company. They'll, they'll want you to have that, that um, FAA Part 107. 
So anyway, um, yeah, so okay, there's a little bit of technologies. Other, th other questions, what are some other questions you guys have or were wondering about or wish that we talked about, touched on? I would say um, how to like increase like the continuity of stuff, especially because it seems like a lot of it kind of like- With like biodiversity? No, but like, like the policy and like- ah bureaucratic like yeah. side of it like how to like really sure. improve that yeah yeah so okay so eddie's question is how, how do we how uh let's see what do i put that under i put that under um maybe how to be more efficient or how, how to move forward with with effective conservation um if i knew that i would i would be super smart I, I'm, I'm not i'm not sure the answer to that one i would say um again as conservation biologists we're grounded in the science and then we also work in these other arenas. But I think, I think your question is more like, how should the policy people be better? Or how should the, the organizing system of governance be better? And that one is, that one's sort of, that one's kind of beyond me. Um, I would say, um, again, regardless as to whether you guys become conservationists when you graduate and do that kind of stuff, you all, you all will be called upon to answer conservation questions. You're gonna be asked to vote on things. You're gonna be at Thanksgiving dinner with your crazy aunt and she's gonna say some weird, stupid stuff she hears on some weird, crazy, anti-science news channel. And, and she'll say, blah, blah, blah. Well, there's always been plants on the earth and there always will be plants on the earth. So why do we care, right? That kind of stuff. And so you guys need to speak truth to power in a fun way. Don't be an a-hole and don't say you're, shut up, you know, or something like that, like you, like you might wanna say. Um, but, but, um, but you need to engage in that arena and when we're called upon to, to support these, these policies, right? I mean, one of the trends that's become very, I'm, I'm starting to riff here now, so if people have other topics, you guys should ask, but um, one, of the, one of the very clear strategies that has been offered lately, um, so to be, so I, I don't know if you guys know this, so you guys know that the, um, the, I, the current conceptualization of carbon footprint, like what's your carbon footprint? That was created by BP, you guys know that? Yeah, so that was created by P BP to make you feel bad and to make you obsess over your own behavior and to make you feel guilty, right? So it was created, I mean, the, the, the concept, the historic concept was not, it was created by an academic, but a marketing firm, a PR firm for BP about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, said, hey, this is great. We're gonna talk about this. And so they, they developed our modern idea of a, a carbon footprint and a, a carbon footprint calculator. And it worked fantastically well. We all talk about carbon. I talk about carbon footprint, right? I mean, it, it's a useful idea, but a lot of people obsess over it, right? Obsess over it. That's not the, your carbon footprint isn't the problem, right? The system is the problem that creates all this stuff, right? It shouldn't be, you shouldn't be sitting in the supermarket wasting 45 minutes trying to figure out which cereal box you should buy, so which one, do you know what I'm saying? All the cereal boxes should be sustainably produced. The food should be sustainably produced, right? And then you can pick based on flavor or whatever the heck, right? But this idea of putting it on you, the individual, it's your fault that this is going on. Um, to be sure, we all have individual responsibilities and we should, we should behave responsibly, but, but that's not where it stops, right? It should, it, that should be translated into the systemic policies that support biodiversity, the systemic policies that support environmental justice, those things. Um, and, and that's what you guys need to support. And so again, even if you don't become a conservation professional, you will be called on to weigh, upon, weigh in on these things. Uh, it might be about production of plastics, it might be about whatever but it's very important you guys stay engaged. And that's what we really need to get sort of to Eddie's thing, which is how do we, how do we be more efficient at the sort of the macro scale? And um, not that we can't be biting our, taking our little bites of cake, but we really need to work on the whole pie, you know what I'm saying, at the same time. And, um, and, and that's what we really need more of. Um, so um, there, there, there's, there's, the, there's a lot of um, rays of hope in California the federal government is so, we are so apart as a people. We, we so hate each other and so think the other side is complete pure evil and whatever. It's difficult to see anything like that systemic change 
in the near future coming out of Washington in terms of federal policy. But, you know, maybe. Um, but, but I think, um, I think uh, with all of these conservation issues, it's really important that we, we don't turn off everybody, right? That we engage everybody. And I think sometimes, sometimes we as a community here um, kind of say like, oh, those effing evil oil people or those hunters or those whatever. And that's not really a success strategy, right? We got to bring everybody together and we got to pull everyone together. And, and we've had too much of separating. So I think to get to Eddie's point, we need, if we, if we remain thinking that everybody's evil and everybody's like the, the absolute worst thing ever, um, we can't get to that more systemic thing. Wow, that was deep. That got really deep very fast. Other things, other ideas you guys are wondering about that you wanted us to go into. Max? I think it would have been interesting to also look at like the, the lesser known species of ocean sea, like the pollen with those little fish necklaces. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so, so let's see. Okay, so Max is asking about the, 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 the rarer things or, or the, the non popular things. I mean, by definition, it's hard to get information on them, so it's hard for me to talk about them a lot. Um, but is there one in particular you're thinking of or anything you're? Um, just announced that the last known uh, turtle in China, in China, like soft shell turtle, died. At least the last one they've been observing. They still believe that there's a couple left in the wild, but they haven't found any more. Yeah. Um, let's see. What can I tell you guys about that? Um, I would say, um, yeah. I mean, I would say, I would say, I'd love to lecture more about those things. Again, it's really hard to the quantitative data together. Um, um, uh, well, so we know that we, so we know that we, we uh, the judge ruled that we can include invertebrates definitely in terms of the Endangered Species Act, even though um, for a long time they haven't necessarily been in there or they haven't been, have the full weight. Um, uh, we have our first marine invertebrate, the white abalone was listed a few uh, years ago, um, which is one of seven abalone species in, in California, and um, uh, very hard to see. So when I was your age, and I was working out at Catalina with researchers, we would get um, pink abalone, which was similar, for dinner. And we get green abalone for dinner, and lobster for dinner. And so most, most nights we ate seafood. We like ate what we caught. Um, and then we'd have a break and we'd have, uh, some of you guys don't know, but this old comedian named Phyllis Diller. For some reason, in her later career, she started making food products. <laughs> and so she made this Phyllis Diller's chili. And I don't know why, but it was super crazy good. It probably had some horrible <laughs> toxic stuff in it. So we, would, uh, we, were, we had so much seafood and we ate seafood all the time that when we'd want to break, we would make uh, chili cheese omelets with Phyllis Diller's uh, stuff. So for us, the break was, the change was, oh, let's have some eggs and, and chili. Um, now, if you guys were to go to, my re to where I work there, um, there's no abalone. Um, and the, there's, there's probably a few white abs, but there's mostly not there. Um, and so, so you guys couldn't eat the same food that I ate even just you know, 25 years ago in terms of um, stuff. And so white abalone or abalone are part of that story, um, but the, the more important things, according to Max, Max's questions, are the smallest things. The little teeny tiny mussel, the little teeny, um, I don't know, little fly or whatever, right? That, that we don't even know, we, we don't even have the experts to find them to, to figure out if they're here or not. So I'd say, I'd say that's a real challenge, but that's, that's I, I don't see that one as changing much. I mean, I, I, think, I think we have, so, um, so how many people here have taken, let's see, the ichthyology class? One. How many people have taken invert zo? One. How many people have taken um, uh, Professor Denton's uh, plant class? One. Right. So that's part of the problem, right? And I'm not, I'm not blaming you guys, right? But, but, but um, I'm just saying systemically. This is another case where we, t we this is not an attack on you guys at all, <laughs> but it's, it, it's a system. It's a system. So, uh, uh, so I'm a marine biologist by training. Um, when I was a young boy, there was all kinds of marine biology, what we would, what we would call conservation-related disciplines 
and places like, like USC. USC, and I don't want to throw USC under the bus, but I kind of do. But so they, so they are, um, they uh, had one of the top marine biology departments in the world. They had these fantastic folks studying bioluminescent, these fantastic invertebrate zoologists, these fantastic, all these people. And um, uh, then in the late 70s, early 80s, the revolution in um, geno genomic technology and, and, um, and subcellular physiology and all this great stuff just really exploded. And that institution, which is known for wanting to make a lot of money, as much money as they can, they decided very coldly that you don't make money doing conservation stuff. We make money doing genetic research and biomedical research. So they pivoted their department and they essentially gutted everybody. So their faculty all retired or moved to other universities. And there is maybe one guy still there, he might be emeritus now, that was left, right? And that process has been repeated over and over again. So when I went to school, uh, let me step back. So the generation before me, they would go and everybody Everybody, if you're a bio, if you're an ESR major, you all would have taken invertebrate zoo. You would have taken, um, you know, maybe not every single class, but you all would have had several classes practically identifying organisms out in nature, right? So this is this what this worm is, this is what this plant is, whatever. Um, those folks basically spent all their, those experts, those professors were knowledgeable in the, um, the organisms and they knew all their stuff. They retired, and a lot of their students basically took their notes. And so how to teach an invertebrate zoology class became the graduate student's notes that he helped the professor teach way back when. Now those folks are retiring. And so the folks that are teaching invertebrate zoo and plant you know, um, botany and stuff like that are now often the students of the students. And so each generation we lose a little bit. Because these subsequent generations, it's not that they're dumb people, they're smart people, but they're, they're spending some of their time doing genetic work and some of their time doing other things, right? They're not like just living and breathing plants all day, all long, like, like the older generations did, right? And so because, because there isn't the funding for what we would call natural history, we've lost some of that capacity. And so that's a, that, that's, that's a real struggle. And so... So that's an example of something where I think we could, we could do more of and we could, we could get better about. But our society doesn't really, our, our academic system doesn't reward that studying natural history. It's considered sort of not exciting science or whatever. I think it's super exciting science. Like what, what, what's, what kind of shark is that, right? But, but um, it definitely has a reputation of old dudes, old white dudes looking through microscopes kind of things like by themselves listening to classical music kind of like, kind of archetype, right? Um, and uh, and that, 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 that's, not, that's not true, but, but that stereotype is powerful, right? So you're like, oh, why do we want to fund that? That looks boring and stupid and whatever. Um, but um, all the good research, or almost all the cool stuff comes from basic science, right? So there was a guy that started studying roundworms, right? Um, C. elegans forever and ever. People are like, what the hell is this guy doing? Studying it, what the hell is that? This is like boring, some weird worms. That guy's a freak, right? Just a whole career, study him, study him. Hardly any money, start him. Then when the genetic tools came around, started sequencing them. And now C. elegans is this fantastically important model organism that we use in all kinds of gene expression studies and all kinds of stuff. And so, so it's hard to know what, what will spring from that basic um, natural history foundation. And, and, and a lot of us worry that we're just losing that, right? That, that there, there's fewer people, professors teaching it, and there's fewer of you guys interested in it, and our systems aren't encouraging guys to get grounded in those, that basic fundamental stuff. And so, um, and that's fundamental for a lot of this conservation stuff, right? If we don't know what's there, we can't tell you who the, the small micro disappearing critter is, if there isn't somebody that can identify that critter, so. When I was doing my PhD, uh, at one point, I, these bunch of jelly, wait, what are they? Anemones, these stinging anemones started showing up on some of my cages, and they started stinging my lips. And I was like, what the hell? Because when you, when you dive, you have a, you know, a regulator in your mouth, your lips stick out, and I was like, what the fuck? 
And, and after a while, I was like, oh my God, there's tons of these things on all my cages. I'm like, where do they come from? And I asked some friends, like, I don't know what that is. I asked some other people, I don't know what that is. And I finally, I think, I think it's like a new, a new species or maybe an invasive species coming in or something, right? And I had to scrape those things off and put them in a preservative and send them to Kansas was the, lo was the nearest local anemone expert on that, that division of anemones. And so, you know, maybe the nerdy professor, or not professor then, but maybe the nerdy student guy would do that, but Joe Blow is not gonna go, you know, do that. And so, so almost by definition, these rare, hard to see things, they're almost assuredly gonna, we're gonna lose them because we just don't have the capacity to, to even identify them. Wow, that was, that was a bummer. That was a, that was a negative one. Other topics? I think it's very similar to sustainability stuff. I think whatever career you guys go into, um, I don't think you need to go into a conservation quote unquote career necessarily, but you will be called upon to make some actions, right? So your company or your firm or your whatever is gonna say like, do we really wanna put solar panels on top of the ceiling because it's kind of a pain, right? Um, you, that, that, that's a huge thing, right? Reducing our environmental impact in and of itself is a benefit to to conservation goals, right? So if you can ride your bike to work, even like one day a week, right? I mean, better every day a week, but, but that kind of stuff. Choosing where you guys live proximate to where you work, right? Is a great, it w w you know, is a cool thing. So I'd say that, that level of stuff, everybody can play a role in, because we all will be called upon to do this kind of stuff. Um, I think it also is on us as folks that are the working folks, the ones that are employed, to take some of the hits ourselves. Because um, I, mean, I threw out the example of solar panels, right? Not everybody in our community can afford those things, right? So we have structures and things to encourage, to, to underwrite, support people to be able to engage in those more sustainable practices. But when we're working for a company or an entity that has the ability internally to afford to do that themselves, we should, right? So we should, we should take the hit so that the resources to help people that, that can't get by are really spent on the communities that really most need those, those resources. So I'd say that those are those a couple of simple things. Um, yeah, and I think, I think it's also important uh, that you guys bring these topics up when you're working, right? You talk about, hey, what's our, what is our, we're making this package for blah, blah, blah. Like, what, do we need to have all these bags? Like, you know, I'd say question. Not, not jerkily question, but why, why do we need to do this, right? Do we really need to do this? Like, you know, do we need to put this packaging here? Do we need to put this, I don't know, however many layers of stuff on this thing? Um, and I, I think, that's not going to save the world. I'm not Pollyanna-ish about that. But, but, but having those conversations and making us constantly think, are we doing the right thing or are we just doing the stuff that everybody has always done for the last 10, 15 years, I think is really important. Um, but I'd say, I'd say uh, there's all kinds of cool careers. Education, a lot of cool stuff. Um, we actually have some students that go into law enforcement, ironically. So a lot of like, our, our game wardens here in Ventura County are graduates of our university, our program. Um, and so like those folks are like related to conservation, they're not actively doing conservation, but they do, they do a lot of conservation. People work for water districts, that kind of stuff. Other questions, somebody else had a question? Um, it's just like your opinion, but why do you think there's like, like climate change deniers in our society? I don't know, I don't understand why. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. So I, when I talk about climate change, I usually have, I put this picture up of, um, so, uh, you know, as, I've, as we've talked about, I, 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 um, I guess I still theoretically do, but, but I don't actively work in Eastern Turkey much anymore. Um, but that's a very conservative place. So a lot of the, a lot of the towns that we work in, um, like women are full, full on, you know, burqas, hijabs, they're, they're like, they're boom. Um, uh, when, like in some place, if I ask a girl something, she'll like run away because I am a man and I'm asking her a question. Like so, so very conservative thinking, right? Um, 
Can I tell you guys a story? So, so, so years ago, I was, uh, we were um, getting lunch in this falafel shop in this, in this little teeny tiny town, um, very close to the Iranian border, and we're eating, and everybody's Turkish in the group except for me, and I, my back is, there's a TV in the corner, and there's a news, like midday news uh, broadcast on, and I'm eating, and as we're eating, and Turks are very loud, that's a, that's a, that's a like the hangout with Turkish folks. Um, and, and they're like, and all of a sudden they all get super quiet. The whole, the whole room gets quiet. And I'm like, I'm eating, I look up, and everybody's, everybody's stopped what they're doing. They're staring at the screen, and they're, and they're listening. And I'm like, what? And it's a guy talking in Turkish, and I don't speak Turkish. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And I'm thinking, oh my God, there's another terrorist bombing, or there's a something, whatever. And so I asked my friend, I say, like, what's going on? He goes, Shh, hold on a second. So, okay, so I wait. So, you know, story finishes up 30 seconds later, and then people go back to talking. And I said, what the hell was that? He said, new um, forecast for rainfall um, based on the new climate change models. And so in this super ultra conservative area, they're like, totally believe it. Yep, it's a real thing. We totally see it's happening. And so they wanted to listen as to what the predictions for these mostly subsistence, very poor farmers, what, you know, they're like, yeah, give me that information. I want that information. It's really pretty much only the US and Australia. There's a few other pockets around there, but it's really those two places where we have this massive, and, and it's not massive, right? That's the other thing to say. It's about 10 to 15 percent of the population. It sounds like it's massive. It sounds like it's everybody's denier. It's not. It's a small chunk. Um, and we've been doing these surveys in my coastal man. If you guys want to learn about this, you should take my coastal management class in the fall. But, but so we've been doing these surveys every year for um, I don't know. 14 years, 15 years, 16 years, something like that. Um, and so we know exactly what our local community thinks. And we, we constantly, ha or we, ha we have a background level of folks that think, or the question we ask is, uh, climate change is a serious problem we need to deal with now. It, it, so it, it doesn't, doesn't say what we should do, it just says, is this like a real serious issue? And so there's always, you know, like about 15% of people that say, nope, not a real issue to deal with, right? But just to emphasize, that's 15%, right? That's not, that's not 50% or 70% or whatever. When we look at the news and, and read stuff, it sounds like it's 50%. It sounds like it's everybody, right? Those folks are just very vocal. And those folks tend to be in powerful places. Um, but uh, uh, so, so the denialism is basically greed, is what, was what I've come, this is my personal opinion, this is my personal opinion. But it seems it's, it's mostly down to greed and then a subset of folks that are just massively ignorant and, and lean into their ignorance and like their ignorance. Um, and so uh, when we ask questions in that survey, when we have disasters, we'll ask, like we have the Thomas fire, in the wake of the Thomas fire, say, hey, do you think climate change made the Thomas fire worse? Do you think climate change is making the drought worse? The vast majority of people, yep. Yep, totally. Yep, 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 yep. Um, and so, so the reality is there, but there's this, this background. So it, it's, it's unfortunately become just like um, immigration, these other things. It's become now, people don't even think about many of the folks that say climate change isn't real are often the same folks that say, they, they don't, they don't want to learn. They don't, they're not, they don't want to hear a debate. They don't want to hear, they're just like, that's what I think, because I, I vote this way, and I live in this community, and da 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 da, da and boom. And so, um, so it, it is, um, it's a delay tactic, ultimately. So it's the same folks that did, it's literally the same exact folks that, that said uh, cigarettes don't cause cancer, same exact folks. Same folks that said seat belts, if you put in seat belts, people, more people are gonna die. What the fuck? Yeah, right? <laughs> And so, uh, you know, just ridiculous claim. I mean, just like, don't make f sense on the face of them. Um, but uh, I think the reason why it's persisted as long as it has, quite honestly, one of the main, main reasons is social media. Is social media. And so it's so easy now to disappear into your rabbit hole of just what you want to hear. And the algorithms are designed to either just feed you that or feed you the outrage. That, that it, it either makes you comfortable in your bubble 
or it makes you think that there's a bigger bubble out there that might be coming to attack you, and neither of which is, is real. Um, so, I mean, the number one thing, the U.S. Naval War College, the num number, so the U.S. Naval War College that trains our future naval officers and things like that, the number one thing they game is not terrorist attack, is not Russia invading Ukraine or anything like that. The number one thing they, they game is um, uh, uh, climate change induced instability um, in a nuclear power. So, so, so what, they, what they recognize is where this, so it's the Syrian war, the Syrian civil war, climate change, right? So the drought sparked that. So, so several years of drought um, made clear, it's pretty clear now, made much more intense by climate change. And then these farms failed. And that's what led to the social unrest. And those folks that were so frustrated, they eventually came into the capital in Syria and started saying, we want change. And that led to the civil war. And so that's, so that's essentially, that kind of stuff is what the Naval War College games, right? I mean, they do, they do all kinds of stuff, but they sort of say like, hey, so Bangladesh, you know, most of the country is within, you know, a meter or a large fraction of the population is within about a meter of sea level. Couple years, sea level's getting higher and higher, and a typhoon comes right at the wrong time, right, we're about to harvest rice, inundates the crops, all of a sudden everybody's flooded, no food or whatever, super poor, can't do anything. Refugees start moving over to, to India or Pakistan or whatever, and we, we let all these refugees in first, and then the government starts getting pushback from people. Well, we should take care of our own first. Why are we taking care of these foreigners, right? And then they'll close the gate, and then they'll put some 18-year-old with a rifle and say, hey, don't let anybody else in. And like, if anybody goes in the gate, like, shoot them. And the poor kid will be there with an assault rifle, right? And then there'll be some starving mom with some baby that's clearly malnourished and she just wants her baby to live and she please please take my baby over the border and the kid would go no step back he goes please 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 he goes step back I'm gonna shoot please 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 and then the kid accidentally shoots her or something like that and then somebody has on a cell phone and then all of a sudden boom so that's how that's how um, these climate change things are playing out and that's becoming so real that even these folks that claim that climate change isn't real they're starting to like, well, I guess we should prepare for that, right? And so, so, um, so again, the reality is, uh, uh, and, the, and then the, the last thing that's really gonna help with this is what's just happened last year or so, um, these, these non-carbon intensive fuels um, have become competitive for electricity generation. And not just competitive, cheaper. And so to be clear, Texas is yanking, which Texas is the largest source of uh, w wind power in the U.S., and they're, and they're getting really close to um, solar. Uh, I mean, we proportionally lead California, but, but numerically, just because of the larger state, Texas has more stuff. Um, they've, they, they have a bill in front of the legislature to defund, so they have all these things to promote business, because we're a business loving business. Um, and, th and they're voting to not give any of those incentives to any of the solar industry. So there's all these incentives. Hey, if you start a business and you hire folks, we'll give you a tax break, except for the people that work in the solar industry and that kind of stuff. So even though they're attacking as much as they can um, for stupid reasons, um, it's still cheaper. And so it's, it's, so it's just, there's just gonna be more wind, there's gonna be more solar, there's gonna be more alternative fuel stuff. And, and it's, the momentum's already there. And so, so there basically will be no more coal plants in the US. There's just, there just won't be. And the question now is we're get, starting to get close to the price of natural gas. Um, and so, 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 in other words, the economics of these things are starting to become easy. When you had to really go out of your way to put solar on your house, to go find this out, and you had to be a crazy hippie with a Prius and a this and a that, right? That was kind of weirdos. But now it's becoming mainstream. The ability to reduce our carbon footprint, the ability to um, be more sustainable, and that, by definition, is going to undermine some of that opposition because it's going to just be very easy to not do a bad thing. So, whereas when, it, when you had to really seek it out, it was easier for people to say, those folks are weird, those folks are blah, blah, blah. They're, they're coming after my lifestyle, right? And when you can drive around and, you know, like the number one luxury car for several years has been uh, Teslas, right? When like the luxury car is also not fossil fuel intensive, it's, that sort of changes the this, this scheme of things. Still better than fossil fuels? 
Yes. Yes. Some of the other yes. Okay. So with all these things we're learning about with conservation biology, et cetera, uh, there is no perfect solution. There's, there's, everything has a downside. There's, there's trade-offs everywhere. Fundamental trade-offs are, are where we are in our society right now. Um, uh, that is a red herring, that, that the batteries are like, really, is that worse than, than a hurricane destroying New Orleans? Like, like I, I get it, it's true, there, there are downsides and there are issues with uh, supply, uh, the countries we get this from and the labor practices, as well as the environmental impact, all that kind of stuff are real. Um, but we shouldn't stop. And we, we, need, we need all of the, where we are right now to, to have successful conservation outcomes, to have more sustainable outcomes, we need like everybody. Like, like all, yep, let's do that, yep, let's do that. Like we need to like be pushing all the levers to make it. So if anybody attended our departmental seminar three, three four weeks ago, we had one of the um, associate directors of the California Energy Commission come, and he modeled where our California uh, energy, sustainable renewable energy production is supposed to be. We have very aggressive targets. And, uh, and right now, we're gonna meet them. If every single project goes in on time and is built on time. And as we were just talking about earlier, it's very easy, like, oh, I'll get this done in a year. Oh, I meant two years. Oh, I meant three years, right? And so if we miss those targets, we, we will miss, if, if we miss those, each of those individual targets, we'll miss our overall goals. But, um, but the point is we're, we're moving rapidly. In those, in those ways. Other questions, other, other, other specific conservation biology questions you guys are wondering about before we finally, finally wrap up here. Okay, cool. I'll just say, uh, the, the only last thing I was gonna say was that um, if you guys are interested in very, these various things, these are a couple classes that they came up. So intro to GIS is 328. There's also 228, which 228 doesn't really work for our major, but for bio, if you guys, that's also an option, you guys can take 228. Um, uh, uh, either one would be a good intro. Either one would give you a good just sort of career level intro to GIS, and so I'd encourage you guys to think about that. Um, remotely piloted systems um, is the 370. That's the drones class. That's just one day a week. That's on Fridays. Uh, restoration ecology is another one that you guys might be interested in. So that is um, basically uh, actively restoring stuff and how we, how we think about doing that. And so that's also a class only on Fridays next semester. Uh, my coastal class. And then the other thing to, to think about lastly is you guys should consider our service learning trips. Um, unfortunately, your the bio hasn't run. So we used to do joint trips with bio. Um, we haven't done, since the pandemic, we haven't really done that. And um, my colleague that ran our Costa Rica trip is now retired. And so um, uh, Professor Alvarado is running the Costa Rica trips now. I don't know what her plans are for the next year or two. But for next year, um, our plans are, assuming we get funding, um, we're definitely going to New Orleans again and to Hawaii. Um, I'm not sure when Dr. Steele is, get, when we're gonna do the Hawaii trip. Sometimes we do it over spring, uh, winter break, sometimes we do it over spring break. I think it'll be a winter break trip. But both of those are IRA supported trips. And so you guys pay one third the trip cost, the school pays two thirds the trip cost. So there still is money involved, but it's super, super cheap to do these things. In New Orleans we work, as you guys probably Heard, heard when I talked about it, we, we do um, wetland restoration and, f and sustainable food systems in New Orleans. The Hawaii trip does humpback whale um, behavior and, and mother calf monitoring uh, with drones and from small boats um, in the Maui Channel. So they go to the island of Maui um, for about a week or 10 days. Uh, so those are, those are other ways for you guys to keep involved with conservation stuff. Um, and then the last thing I would just say is if you guys are interested, you know, come talk to me or come talk to your other professors. There's all kinds of great conservation research going on here. Um, we're, we just signed an agreement, an MOU with the Santa Barbara Zoo. So we're gonna be start building a conservation facility here on campus behind our lab at MODOC to start growing up um, rare species and, and, and endangered species and things of that nature. So obviously that's not gonna be in place for next year for you guys, but, but um, if you're interested, come talk to us because we have things going on related to that kind of stuff. And if you guys want to be involved with conservation stuff there. And then also um, check out our ESRM community page because we have all kinds of opportunities there related to um, various things, including conservation. Are you going to be involved in the zoo? 